Well, I have got the joyous um, moment of introducing Andrea McLean, direct from her very glamorous and gorgeous bedroom. How are you? Hello. It's so funny, isn't it? Because I'm only here sitting on the floor, literally with this laptop resting on an ottoman, because this is the quietest room. Because I've, I've got really good curtains in here and lots of soft furnishings. But at any moment, I could be joined by a dog, a child, anybody. So as long as that's all right, we're all good. That's so fine. I mean, exactly. I've been kind of like going around the house. The, the, our internet here is so terrible because we live in kind of in Sussex in the middle of nowhere. And it's, oh, so if anything happens, apologies, people who are, are listening. But um, I, I found out something that I never knew about you, um, which was that, yes, you were born in Glasgow, but then you spent the first 15 years of your life in Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah. How did that, why was that? Well, my, my dad was an engineer. And he worked for yeah. Tate and Lyle, the um, sugar people. Okay. And mm -hmm. basically, my, my dad left school at 16 with, well, 15, actually, with nothing. No, no O-levels, A-levels, anything. He just left. And uh, he got an apprenticeship with a firm in Glasgow who basically made machinery that was then put into factories all around the world. And he, he married my mum. They'd met at 15, 16. They got married at sort of 20 and 21. And he got offered the chance to go to the Caribbean and put some of this machinery into a factory. And, you know, they'd never even been abroad before. They'd, they'd got a little flat round the corner from uh, my mum's and my dad, who my, my granddad was a carpenter on the ships in the Clyde. My granny was a cook in the kitchens on the Clyde. And that was going to be their kind of upbringing. My mum was training to be a hairdresser. And um, they went out, what was supposed to be for six months, then it extended to two years and it ended up being their whole life. My parents basically lived abroad for the rest of their adult life, bar a few years uh, when I was a teenager, we moved back here for a while. And then as soon as I was old enough, they headed back off again. So yeah, moving to Trinidad changed all our lives. It was wonderful. It was a great place to grow up. Of course. But, but how, so how come did you, when did you first come to the UK without your parents? Well, I came back... Um, we all moved back together. There was, you know, we discussed the idea of boarding school and that sort of thing when I was a teenager to do my O-levels and A-levels. And uh, we all decided as a family that actually we'd rather stay together. So we came back to the UK when I was 15 and uh, I went to school in the Midlands and then uh, because that was where my dad had got a job. And then we moved to Cheshire because he moved again with his job. Basically, by the time I was 17, I'd been to nine different schools in just four different countries around the world. I also lived in the Philippines for a year when I was eight and nine because of my dad's job. So we moved wow. around a lot. How did that affect your confidence, having to make new friends all the time? That's such a good question. And I think that it's something that a lot of people don't really understand how much that shapes you. Um, just depending on how you are as a person, my, I'm really close to my sister. She's four years younger than me, and she handled it very differently. And I don't know if it was because of the ages she was at the times that we moved. She just kind of marched in and said, hi, I'm Linda, and settled straight in and made this massive group of friends wherever she went. I was older every time and always a bit more gauche and shy and insecure mm. and reserved. And so in terms of making friends I always seem to move either halfway through a school year or halfway through a term when everyone had already got their group so I always ended up with people who hadn't formed a group yet if that made sense mm. um and I was always just happy with anyone who would have me and that kind of carried on for the rest of my life <laughs> I know I know but also I mean living in all those exotic locations that must have really affected your the way you dressed didn't it? I mean, did you bring all sorts of wonderful fabrics and things from those places and so from Trinidad to the Philippines or Philippines to, the Trin to Trinidad? Do you know, it did, but not in the way that you would think, almost in the opposite way to you would think. What it did was basically I grew up in, in third world countries for all of my formative years. And what that did was it meant to me clothes 
were just something that were bright, comfortable. My mum made, we didn't have a lot of money growing up, so my mum made most of our clothes. She, do you remember the butterick patterns? And uh, you could yeah. get all sorts of different patterns, yeah. Vogue patterns, all sorts of things. And our treat would be, if we'd been good, was we could go and choose a pattern, and choose some material, and mum would make us our, our clothes. And she'd always make my sister and I identical outfits, and then little tiny ones for our dolls. So we would all sort of dress the same. Just crazy family. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But what it meant was I um I had no idea about labels, mm -hmm. about, you know, we moved back to the UK and suddenly it was what kind of trainers did you wear and this was sort of brand. G growing up, I wore Bata shoes. Now, anyone who lives in a third world country or has been to a third world country, Bata is a shoe shop. It's B-A-T-A. -A. You get it all around like Africa, uh, Indonesia, the Caribbean. And it, that's the kind of that was the kind of main shoe shop, so I got flip flops and little plimsolls and this sort of thing. I didn't care what brand anything was. It was just if I liked how it looked, and you know, if I had a denim jacket, I would paint on the back of it and stick things on and sew things on. But I never cared what label anything was, and I find it really quite sad now that kids they rely on brands for their creativity. They don't think of making something themselves because everyone's going to laugh at them because it's not got a certain name on it rather than thinking, do you know, for example, I loved Calvin and Hobbes. The, um, it was a cartoon with a, a little boy who had a tiger who he thought came to life. So I painted a great big Calvin and Hobbes on the back of my denim jacket and embroidered some flowers and did all that. I wore that in my 20s. Didn't care whether I looked ridiculous or not. It was how I wanted to express myself. And kids seem to be a bit too afraid to do that now. Yeah, they do. But I do think, I don't know how you, I don't, how old are your children? Um, nearly 19, nearly 14. Okay. So I, I do think it's changing. I do think it's changing because now it's all about Depop and... I mean, certainly speaking for my children, they'll go to charity stores and secondhand stores and vintage, and they really don't care about labels. It's until it comes to trainers, then they care. But everything else, they don't care. And, and it's kind of like, you know, so much of, of fashion is influenced by um, Japan. And in Japan, for a long time, they've been kind of anti-label. It's all about wearing clothes that um, could could uh, have come from anywhere and hopefully that will now infiltrate our markets because I agree it is sad that they don't customize their own clothes and well funny enough my, my son's thing. just left home he's gone to university which that was a whole other thing in itself oh, yeah um I know. oh I can't believe how much I cried oh, me too for 24 hours sobbed out loud yeah literally and I don't cry but my god I made up for it I literally went, went upstairs, sat on his bed and sobbed. And then the only thing that made me feel better was I started tidying his room and then I was furious at how dirty it was. So it, it was fine. <laughs> Equilibrium was, was restored. <laughs> but because he's, you know, he's a boy, he's, he's left home, he's always had his own sort of sense of style, as it were. And I'm quite looking forward to seeing what he's going to come home with. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What sort of clothes he's going to pick not. up? Who he's going to be influenced by? Is he going to come back with? You know, I remember I bought an old, I literally, when I was a student, I remember I've always quite liked hairy bikers for some reason. You'd never think yeah. it looking at me, yeah. but I do. I quite like right, kind of old. rough yeah. and tattooed and beardy and uh, I yeah. love all that okay. sort of, yeah. I know you like your sort of grunge music and I like my shouty music in, in a more rock sort of way and I remember going to a party yeah. once and there was this proper biker there and I went over and chatted to him about you know his motorbike and his beard and all the sort of stuff you chat to a biker about and I said I love your jacket and the drunker I got uh, the more money I offered him for it <laughs> at the end of the night I went home with this biker's jacket and I wore no, it the whole time not. how much do you pay for it do you remember I can't even remember can't even remember oh there were vodka jelly God. shots and beer and all it was messy but I did buy his jacket off I mean the balls of you that's amazing that's maybe that's another way of shopping now is just go up to some randomer who's wearing something that you like the look of and say how much you pay can I have it how yeah, much do you I love take? that can I have yeah. it? imagine
imagine. I think you'd be really flattered if someone came up to you and said, I really like what you're wearing. How much do you want for it? Yeah. Okay, look, we might have something we can start now. So going back to the Caribbean, um, did you go to a lot of the carnivals? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Every year. Carnival in Trinidad isn't like carnival over here where we sort of get to the bank holiday and think, do you fancy going? I don't know. Do you fancy going? What's the weather like? Yeah, I might go. I might not. There is no question whether you go or don't go. The whole country goes to carnival. And you might not necessarily go to Port of Spain. You might not necessarily go to the sort of main event, but everybody has carnival parties in the sort of build up to it. So from when I was a tiny, tiny tot, you had your carnival costume, you got excited over what you were going to wear. And then as you got a bit older, it got to be a little bit more cool and who you were hanging out with and that sort of stuff and what band you were going to chip behind and, and this sort of thing. But it was all about expression. It was about the music. I still, my heart soars whenever I hear, whenever I hear Caribbean music, it literally transports my soul. I think it's wonderful, wonderful sound. Mm. Do you miss it? Do you miss do you miss that the Caribbean? Would you go back there often? I missed it for a very long time. I was quite cross when we moved back to the UK. Um I was I, I was a very polite daughter, so I think I only mentioned it once, but deep down I was very cross. You know, I went to a normal school. I had I had a, a really original and lovely upbringing. I was the only white girl in my class. I was only the only white girl in my group of friends. So it was extremely sort of cosmopolitan and and broad thinking in terms of nobody cared what religion you were, what color you were, what what your thought processes were. We just liked each other. And that was how I grew up. And then I moved to the UK and suddenly um, it just seemed that much more rigid. And I found people very rude. People were so sort of smiley and laid back in the Caribbean in terms of you. the pace was so much slower. You'd stop and have a chat. And whereas over here, everyone was very brusque and in a rush and very, very rude. And it took me a while to get my head around that. And I, yeah, I didn't like it very much and wanted to move back. But then I suppose I sort of got used to it like we all do. Have I been back? Many, 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 many times, but never to Trinidad. Oh, my goodness. But um, there's a bit of me wants to keep it frozen in time, and I want yeah, to remember it as it I was. I can that. Mm. I don't want to go back. And I have friends that are still there that I'm still in contact with, friends from school and this sort of thing. And uh, every now and again, they'll send me photos of areas where we grew up. And it th- there's parts of it that haven't survived very well in terms of how I remember it and how they are now so for me I I love Barbados Barbados was where we used to go as a as a child we used to go to either Tobago which was like going to Cornwall we just pop there you know for the weekend Mm. um or we would go to Barbados was the equivalent of going to Spain so people in the UK go to Spain for their summer holidays we would go there And I love Barbados. I have really happy memories of there. So I've taken my kids there quite a few times. And um, I like to get them to stop at a roti shack and try some roti and listen to the music. And they don't quite get it because they've grown up in Britain. They've grown up in a very different environment. But when I, I remember once I, when I was first divorced, I was on my own and I took them away on holiday, just us. And I hired a, a just a normal taxi for a day. And I said, take us around the island and show us the real Barbados. I don't want the kids to just see like a hotel and this sort of thing. Mm. Um, I want to see where you live. Take me where you live. Take me where you eat. I want, to, I want them to see this. They were so bored. Can we go back to the hotel? Really? Can we go and play in the pool? We drove past a sugar factory and I was going, that's where your granddad you know, work day in, day out, he'd sweat, be covered in oil, climbing in, fixing places like these. Mm -hmm. Can we go back and swim now? And so I might try again when they're a little bit older. Yeah, it will will work when they're a bit older because, you know, we have places like that and, you know, a place in Scotland where I used to go to every year as a child and exactly the same took the kids back isn't it amazing look at the river you know take your shoes off feel it smell it uh, 
And then now, they're a bit older, I've taken them back, and they love it, and it's one of their favourite places in the world, and they get it. And I think, you know, they, they have a kind of um, inherent understanding now, rather than being told that it was someone, some, a place that was special to me, they feel it. And that comes with a bit of maturity. Yeah, so as mine were 10 and 5 when I did this little tour. Um, yeah, you know, we've been back before, yeah. uh, since then, and I didn't bother. We just did the lovely things that they wanted to, to do. But yeah, 10 and 5 was a bit... This is younger. my wardrobe malfunction. So what has been your worst? Oh, my God, there's too many to mention. There is too many to mention. Um, I can remember one day I was doing doing the weather and uh we sometimes we would we we would choose our own clothes you'd bring them in and this sort of this sort of stuff as long as they were pastel they didn't care and i had seen i think it was in kukai can you remember kukai from 100 of years ago I remember yeah 100 years ago i think it was there and it was a lilac pvc suit and i thought this was an incredible thing and because i was in my 20s it fit me and looked all right so I bought this lilac pvc suit and I remember I walked in at 5 45 or whatever to get ready to go in front of the camera and the cameraman who I'm still friends with a lot of the cameramen are still the cameramen now that do loose them in uh I remember they're standing behind the the their cameras and they just went like this <laughs> but not in a good way <laughs> not in a good way <laughs> and I didn't quite pick up on the vibe so I was busy preparing anyway earpiece in mic on do all this got to six o'clock did my first broadcast and this is in the olden days before emails and stuff and it was when the, the people used to ring in the phones just went nuts but not not as in what a gorgeous outfit you were it was more what the hell is she doing? And our boss, who was still in bed at home, rang in and went, basically, what the fuck? Tell her to get that outfit off right now. So by that was at 6.01. By 6.25, I was back in my shift dress. I had to take my Lila <laughs> PVC suit off. I tell oh you what, I kept God. the trousers though, and I wore them once on Fun in the Sun with Mr. Motivator because PVC is surprisingly warm if you have to do... Um, uh, early morning broadcast because it looks warm but it's, it looks sunny but still quite cold yeah. and Mr Motivator and I had to do this live going down this funny slide thing and because it was PVC I burnt a hole in my bottom in my PVC trousers live serves on you right. it serves you right I'm sorry shame on you for buying a, a, a lilac PVC suit really I just can't I can't a lilac what a terrible colour for you Andrea awful Awful, awful, awful. What was awful. I thinking? Yeah, so you've got your new book coming out, This Girl Is On Fire, which is out on the 29th of September, so any minute now. And everybody, you've got to read it because it's, it's weirdly, it's kind of everything I expected you to be because you're so warm and open and that really comes through in the book. But there's so much, what I found, there's lots of things that I identified with that, I always thought I was the only person who ever felt them. So I got a lot of comfort from, from reading it uh, about many of the, of the parts. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. It's a, you know, it was quite a terrifying thing actually to write a book like this because yeah. it's, it's the- Heart on your sleeve, opening up. Yeah. yeah. It, you left nothing out. Apart from yeah. things that legal I put, couldn't put in, I left nothing yeah. out. Um, do you know, to be so raw and vulnerable and open was really terrifying because I was scared people wouldn't like me anymore because people have this image of me as the, I'm the very together head girl at the end of the desk who holds all the loose women in, in sort of check. And then for me to put my hand up and go, I actually had a nervous breakdown last year and it was because of extreme trauma that I experienced in my past at the hands of another human and it took going on a tv show where I didn't expect it to happen but every mask I've ever worn was ripped off my face in terms of you know there was a bit in it where we had a bag put over our head this is on SAS who dares wins it's a channel four program mm. 
And it was you were brilliant in that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm so I, so impressed. Yeah, it was. A, that was another thing where I thought, well, I look back on on my life and wish I'd done it, and I didn't want to regret it, and I don't regret it. But mm. but doing that sort of unintentionally and unknowingly to me, it ripped off every mask that I'd ever worn. The sort of the mum mask, the wife mask, the broadcaster mask, and I was just stood there raw, and it forced me when I got home to deal with all these things that I hadn't resolved. I think all of us have been through things in our life and some of them are more traumatic than others. And I do think that one person's trauma does not belittle another, you know, this isn't a tit for tat thing as to who's is worse than it's others. Your, subject, your, yeah. your thing is your thing. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, because I managed to, reach out for help I had some incredible people around me who were able to recommend so experts who gave me advice and books to read and, and and I had therapy as well I just really wanted to pay it forward in the same way as I did with my last book which was all about paying it forward with information with the menopause it was literally that yeah. simple just I can't believe you guys don't aren't getting access to this so here it all is it was the same thing but for me it was it was I wanted to write a self-help book based on stories because I think that anybody can put loads of facts and figures and information out there, but you don't remember them. What you remember is stories. Exactly. You remember Especially somebody. Especially women. Yeah. Women remember stories. We, were, yeah. we relate to it. And I think, like, for example, I've broken it down into chapters, and one of the chapters is called We're All a Mixture of Shit and Brilliance. Mm. And that, I think, is probably the key thing to take away from the book. Don't, especially as women, don't set yourself up to fail by thinking if you don't do everything perfectly, then you've got it all wrong. Actually, nobody really knows what they're doing. We're all just muddling through. And once you get your head around that, actually you realize how brilliantly that, that you're doing. So I, I really appreciate that you like the book. No, Thank I you really so much. Did. I just I want really to help. And, and, you know, having spoken to you now, that you are, you, you are shit, you're brilliant. And it's maybe some of the lilac PVC super shit. But you are brilliant. <laughs> and I've loved, loved talking to you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So lovely. Yeah, and you take care.